Thank you, Paul. Um, and thank you to the you know, United States Capitol Historical Society for, for giving me this opportunity. The short answer to how a guy from Georgia ended up um, <clears throat> editing the papers of Abraham Lincoln uh, goes to um, my divided childhood. My mother is from Georgia, my father is from New York, so I always say that uh, I grew up uh, with a, a heritage on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, I also wanted to say that my presentation today draws heavily on the work of the papers of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, not only is A.J. Shirey one of my uh, fellow presenters today, but several of, the, of my colleagues uh, who are doing research here in Washington at the National Archives uh, are here with us today. So thank you to all of them uh, for making this material available so that, uh, so that I can make this presentation. Although Claire Barton and a few other women had broken the gender barrier to employment in the federal government uh, when they worked with the Patent Office in the 1850s, by 1860, no women worked in federal government offices in Washington. The wartime employment of female clerical workers in the federal government dates to the fall of 1861, when Francis Spinner, as treasurer of the United States, began to employ women to cut and count treasury notes. Abraham Lincoln had appointed Spinner, a former congressman from New York, as treasurer in March of 1861. The mobilization for war drew tens of thousands of men from the workforce while simultaneously expanding the need for clerical laborers. Spinner went to Secretary of the Treasury of Salmon Chase and declared, a woman can use scissors better than a man and she will do it cheaper. I want to employ women to cut the treasury notes. An 1869 editorial uh, in the New York Times explicitly declared that it is owing to Mr. Spinner more than to any other man that this Department of Labor is now open in any degree to women. Although the war created and relentlessly expanded the need for female clerical workers to perform various tasks in the burgeoning federal bureaucracy, it also created a supply of widows, orphans, and other de others desperate for work to support themselves and their families. The Treasury Department and other bureaus and offices in Washington became a vast refuge for the unfortunate and the unsuccessful. According to a woman familiar with the process, in order to secure any government position, the first thing a woman had to do was to go and tell her story to a man, in all probability a stranger, who possessed the appointing power. If the man took a personal interest in her story, he might recommend her appointment. If not, she had no chance of gaining the position unless she could succeed in winning over to her cause another man of equal political power. Although most sought the aid of congressmen and senators, for a substantial number of women across the North, the only man to whom they felt they could apply for aid was President Abraham Lincoln. As early as the fall of 1861, women began writing to Abraham Lincoln requesting assistance in obtaining jobs in the Treasury Department. On September 8, 1861, Mary Tennyson wrote to the President imploring him for assistance. Her husband had been dismissed from the United States Revenue Service for intoxication, and her mother and two little children depended on her for support. Having heard of Lincoln's goodness and kindness, <clears throat> she made bold to write and request that she receive some copy work from one of the departments or bureaus of the government. I am quite hard of hearing, she continued, which adds to my trouble as that infirmity precludes my teaching or otherwise trying to support myself and family. <clears throat> she appealed to him as most gracious president, believing that as the chief magistrate and the father of this great country, you will not hear my petition in vain. Like most of the surviving letters written to him, there is no endorsement by the President, so it remains uncertain whether he read the letter and forwarded it to the Treasury Department, or whether his secretaries did so for him. Another brief, ungrammatical letter a few months later from Jane Munsell informing the President that, I have no employment found yet, and requesting a place in the Treasury Department clipping notes, did receive a coveted endorsement from Lincoln. The President wrote simply, respectfully submitted to the Treasury Department. A. Lincoln, November 13, 1861. There is no indication, however, that Jane Munsell obtained a job in the Treasury Department. Victorian codes of conduct discouraged women from writing to a man they had never met, even, or perhaps especially, the President of the United States. Most of Lincoln's female correspondents who sought jobs with the government asked his pardon for addressing a letter to him. Pardon my presumption in addressing you. 
Imperious necessity impels, read one. Charlotte Reed of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania asked, I must beg you to excuse my presumption in asking your interference in my behalf. I feel that it is a privilege that every loyal citizen of the United States may address the highest authority known to our government. Missouri Finley of New York City wrote, I feel that it is presumptuous for one so humble in position to address a note to one so high in power. You will, I hope, pardon the liberty I have taken, Helen White of Baltimore wrote in December 1863, by addressing you, considering the position you occupy, which is so far superior to my own. But owing to my circumstances, I am compelled to do. Young women sometimes wrote together to the president, perhaps encouraging each other to overcome the sense of impropriety they felt. Molly Howard and Annie White of Friendship, New York, wrote to the president, You will doubtless be surprised at receiving a letter from us, who are entire strangers, and may think we are presuming too much in thus familiarly, familiarly addressing you. We hope we are not transcending the bounds of propriety in so doing. But, sir, it is from the most honorable motives we assume the liberty. They had learned from a young man in Rochester that respectable young ladies could find employment in Washington in the men stamping greenbacks. As they were fatherless and dependent on our own resources for a livelihood, they thought they should apply for a position. It being more lucriferous business, and I thought for a moment I wasn't reading that right, and so I went over it, and actually there is a word, lucriferous, which means gainful or profitable. Um, more lucriferous business than that which we are now engaged in. We are daily laboring for the small penance of 25 cents, which at the present time will hardly afford us the necessaries of life. Similarly, teachers Florence Watson and Delia Swain of Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, apologize for being very bold and presumptuous in writing to the president. For we know you have other and far more important matters claiming your attention. Together, the young women, women wrote, we have formed this project of writing to you, because they had learned that in some departments, lady clerks are employed, and thinking that such a situation would be far more agreeable and profitable than our present one, we came to the conclusion that there could be no harm in writing you a private letter. Surpassing Molly and Annie's vocabulary display, Florence and Delia even included their photographs, thinking you might wish to know how we look. The young women continued, now, dear Uncle Abe, we, have, we having taken one bold step, dare to take another and say that we want very much to hear from you, whether you can do us any good or not, and receive the assurance that you are not offended by our unusual conduct. Other applicants apologized for seeking his time because he had so many other pressing duties. I deem it almost an intrusion at this time to ask you for one moment's attention, wrote Carrie Roser of Philadelphia. But the trouble which has befallen me with the past year almost forces me to so bold an act. Julia Richards of Schenectady, New York, assured the president that I should not have thought of applying to you amid the multiplicity of your cares did I not hope you had something in your gift. 20-year-old Mary Ann Curry of Pottsville, Pennsylvania, was living in Washington, D.C. with her mother and siblings by the spring of 1862. On March 26, she wrote to President Lincoln asking for some employment in any one of the departments in any capacity where I should be competent. She asked for a job to support her mother in, uh, to aid her mother in supporting a large and fatherless family. Two of her brothers were in the Union Army, and she knew no one in Washington to aid her. President Lincoln endorsed the envelope on March 26, the same date as the letter. Secretary of Treasury, please see Mrs. Curry and give her employment if possible. A. Lincoln. Perhaps the first endorsement on the envelope was ineffective, for three weeks later, Lincoln wrote a second endorsement on the back of the letter itself. Secretary of Treasury, please see this poor woman and give her employment if possible. A. Lincoln, April 15, 1862. The President's most recognizable petitioner was Grace Bedell of Albion, New York. In October 1860, 11-year-old Grace Bedell wrote to candidate Abraham Lincoln to suggest that he grow a beard. You will look a great deal better, for your face is so thin. She told him that she had four brothers, and part of them will vote for you anyway, and if you will let your whiskers grow, I will try and get the rest of them to vote for you. <laughs> My father is going to vote for you, and if I was a man, I would vote for you too, but I will try and get everyone to vote for you that I can. Four days later, Lincoln responded, 
As to the whiskers, having never worn any, do you not think people will call it a, a piece of silly affection if I were to begin now and sign the letter, your very sincere well-wisher? On his inaugural journey to Washington, President-elect Lincoln stopped in Westville, New York, and asked the crowd of admirers if Grace Bedell was present. When the crowd passed her forward, he showed her his new whiskers and gave her a kiss. On January 14, 1864, Grace Bedell, now 15 and grown to the size of a woman in her own estimation, again wrote to Abraham Lincoln, having heard that a large number of girls are constantly employed and with good wages at Washington, cutting treasury notes and other things pertaining to that department, she asked the president to show himself her true friend and well-wisher, as he had signed his letter to her. Her father had lost nearly all of his property, and she wanted a job to support herself and help her parents, although they were ignorant of this application to you for assistance. Apparently she had written earlier, but received no reply. She chose rather to think you had failed to receive it, not believing that your natural kindness of heart, of which I have heard so much, would prompt you to pass it by unanswered. Unfortunately, we do not know if Lincoln ever saw either of these letters that she sent. However, she did not get a job in the Treasury Department. First Lady Mary Lincoln sometimes became involved in the recommendation of women for positions. In April 1862, Lincoln wrote a brief note to Secretary of the Treasury Salmon Chase on behalf of Matilda Ivers. Mrs. L. is acquainted with Mrs. Ivers, bearer of this, and will be obliged if the Secretary of the Treasury can give her employment. Seventeen months later, Ivers wrote to Lincoln, I occupied a position in the note trimming room in the Treasury Department through yours and Mrs. L. favor. When the work ceased, we were all dismissed, and I have not yet been reappointed. Ivers hoped that Lincoln would be kind enough to renew your favor, for I am in the greatest need. Please give me a note to Mr. Chittenden and one to Mr. Spinner. In response, this is one of my favorite Lincoln endorsements. Lincoln wrote on the letter, I have no re recollection of Mrs. Ivers, or of the card it seems I have given her. But as it is in my handwriting, I suppose Mrs. L. told me she, was, she knew the lady. The Register of Female Clerks lists Mrs. Lincoln as one of those recommending Mrs. E.D. Baker of Illinois for a position. On May 18, 1864, Baker received an appointment as a copyist in the Treasury Department. She was the wife of Edward D. Baker, Jr., son of Lincoln's Illinois friend and colleague Edward D. Baker, after whom the Lincolns named their second son in 1846. After the elder Baker's death at the Battle of Balls Bluff in October 1861, President Lincoln had helped Edward D. Baker, Jr. in his ascent through the commissioned officer ranks from second lieutenant to captain and assistant quartermaster by March of 1863. Other connections also prompted the president to act on behalf of particular candidates. In January 1864, M.A. Sneed wrote to Lincoln explaining that Joshua Speed brought me to this city and obtained for me an appointment in the Office of Internal Revenue. She lost the position, and because both Speed and another supporter were out of town, she turned to Lincoln. Knowing your friendship for Mr. Speed, in the hope that for his sake, and because I was one of the only two Kentucky ladies employed in the Treasury, you will not refuse me your assistance. She closed, let my being a Kentuckian and the especial protege of Mr. Speed be my excuses for this appeal to yourself. Lincoln endorsed the letter by writing, I do not personally know or remember about this lady, but would be glad for her to have a hearing. As some of his correspondents and petitioners hoped and believed, a recommendation from President Lincoln could be an important asset in seeking a job. Letitia Plunkett wrote to the President on August 20th, 1864. The wife of Major William Plunkett of the 17th Wisconsin Volunteers, 23-year-old Letitia Plunkett, explained that her husband was discharged for disability contracted in the line of duty after having served from April 1861 to May 1863. In his present state of health, she continued, he is unable to earn enough for our support. She also reminded Lincoln that she was the daughter of Captain Charles Pashaw, an old and staunch friend of yours in Illinois, and told him that her brother died at Fort Donaldson, fighting for his country. Plunkett's letter also contained an endorsement from Leonard Farwell, former governor of Wisconsin, and an examiner in the patent office, that the Plunkett's were highly respectable persons. On August 24th, Lincoln added his own endorsement. Commissioner of Internal Revenue, please see and hear this lady. One week later, Letitia Plunkett received an appointment as a counter in the Treasury Department. 
Seventeen-year-old Louisa Knowlton also relied on her father's relationship with Abraham Lincoln in her application for work. On October 20th, 1864, Knowlton wrote to the president with some trepidation. I wish to see you on business, but never having transacted, transacted any for myself before, I feared my courage might fail me. Did I resort to verbal communication before so many strangers? She had introduced herself to Lincoln the previous day as the daughter of Lincoln B. Knowlton, a lawyer from Illinois. He and Lincoln had worked together or opposed each other in a number of cases between 1840 and 1852, but Knowlton had died in the mid-1850s. Louisa Knowlton wrote to Lincoln that, I am a native of dear old Illinois, as you are also. Of course, he wasn't a native of Illinois, but anyway, details. She preferred a job as a copyist, but if that was difficult of obtaining any situation, respectable and remunerative will suffice. She came from Massachusetts with the fond hope that you would assist me. Her widowed mother was struggling to educate the family uh, of five children, and Louisa wanted to help by supporting herself and aiding her mother. Mr. Lincoln, she continued, I know you have a great many applications which seem trivial and harassing to you, but which are everything to the applicants. Please do not turn a deaf ear to my petition, but consult the feelings of your own warm, honest heart, and be assured the blessing of the widow and her orphan children shall rest upon you forevermore, and God will show mercy even as you have done. Lincoln endorsed Knowlton's letter by writing, I do not personally know this lady, but she is, I have no doubt, as she says within, the daughter of my old friend L.B. Knowlton. She writes a very good hand, and I really shall be glad if she can get employment. Honorable Secretary of Treasury, please see her. On December 12, 1864, Knowlton received an appointment in the Treasury Department. Fourteen years later, she was still working for the Comptroller of the Currency at an annual salary of $900. In many cases, female applicants mentioned the military services and sacrifices of fathers, sons, and brothers in support of their applications. In September 1864, New Yorker Julia Peck began her letter, Sir, my brother Charles W. Peck, acting assistant surgeon in the Navy, died while on duty in Pensacola, Florida, of yellow fever. My brother Herbert, a corporal in Duryea's Zouaves, in his 10th battle, second of Bull Run, lost one leg, had the bone of the other leg permanently injured, and lost a part of his left hand. My brothers John B., or James B. and Edwin Peck were both drafted. After reciting her brother's service in the Union Armed Forces, she implored Lincoln's assistance. Although she had filed her application more than three months earlier, with the endorsements of her representatives in Congress, Senators Ira Harris and Edwin Morgan, and Representative Homer Nelson of New York, she had heard nothing more from the Treasury Department. Lincoln endorsed the letter on the same day, referring it to William Fessenden, the new Secretary of the Treasury, with the additional comment, if there is any such position vacant as, as that which this lady desires, I hope she may receive it. She did. Two months later, on December 23, 1864, Julia Peck received a position in the Treasury Department. Surgeon D.W. Bliss at a hospital in Washington wrote a testimonial for Mrs. Alice Rudge. He explained that she had been a nurse for several months and had recently buried her son, who was a corporal in a New York artillery battery. Bliss declared that she was a capable, devoted, and valuable nurse and a lady of estimable character. Upon reading this, Lincoln wrote, Will General Spinner please see and hear this lady, who, though a stranger to me, I believe is a worthy person who has lost her son in our service. The employment records in the Treasury Department also detail the military service of male relatives for some of the female clerks. Mrs. Fayette of Sneed of Kentucky had two brothers in the Army. Miss Juliet Shearer of Pennsylvania had two brothers who served for three months and two brothers who served for three years in the Army. Miss Agnes Houston had one brother and seven cousins in the Army, and the husband of Mrs. Harriet McConnell of New York was also in the Army. Mrs. Carrie Sheeds of Pennsylvania lost four brothers in the Army, and Miss F.S. Hoey of Ohio had a brother killed at Shiloh and another brother who served for three years. Both Mrs. Mary A. McCullough's husband and her brother were killed in the military, and Mrs. Mary McCaffrey of Ohio lost her husband when he was killed at the Battle of Stones River in Tennessee. Some of Lincoln's endorsements in these letters reflect his appreciation of the losses these women had suffered. On a letter from a provost marshal in New York City recommending Mrs. Mary Rusk, Lincoln wrote, 
I shall be glad if any department or bureau can and will give suitable employment to this lady who was widow of one who died in our naval service. Several of Lincoln's female correspondents were teachers who had exhausted their health in teaching and looked for a healthier and more lucrative alternative in clerical work. Maggie Milmore of Milwaukee, which is not easy to say, Maggie Milmore of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, had no brothers who were soldiers, but she had to support her elderly parents and had been teaching school for eight years. She had taught in Missouri, where she, had, she was dismissed simply for being, as they term it, a union lady, a title in which I shall ever glory, even though it annoyed many of her pupils and their parents. Now 27, she wrote to the president, being fully persuaded that among the distinguished personages by whom you are surrounded, I could apply to no one of them possessing a kinder or more paternal heart than the president himself. She signed her letter, I am with due reverence and esteem your excellency's most obedient and docile subject, and added a postscript which read, A line from the president, even though it contain a refusal of my request, shall be treasured by me as a golden thread in the web of my existence. President Lincoln was never able to respond with that golden thread. Maggie Milmore wrote to him on April 13, 1865. The next day, he was fatally shot in the head at Ford's Theater. Together, this collection of letters from women seeking employment in the Treasury Department reveals much about public perceptions of Abraham Lincoln, at least among middle-class women in the North. Many letters mention Lincoln's goodness. of heart, I have presumed to lay my case before him, well knowing that one word from him in the right place will do, me more, do more for me than the united efforts of many congressmen. Gertrude Dunn of Kenosha, Wisconsin, likewise declared that I should not be this bold to solicit your aid did I not know that your kindness of heart always impels you to listen to appeals from the needy and helpless. Helen White of Baltimore had heard of your being a true Christian and I know if it is in your power to assist me, you will not turn a deaf ear to my petition. Having been assured that our present president reads all the communication addressed to him, Missouri Finley of New York City was hopeful that her epistle may not be passed by without at least a passing thought. Confident of the president's innate goodness, kindness, and honesty, these women appealed to Lincoln directly, desperate to have him intervene on their behalf. Ultimately, the Treasury Department hired at least 351 female clerks between 1861 and Lincoln's assassination in April 1865. Of these clerks, 60% were single and 40% were married or widowed. 94 were appointed from the District of Columbia, but many of them had moved to the federal capital to follow husbands, fathers, or other family members who were in government service or the military. The remaining 246 clerks came from 25 states. They came from all of the states of the Union, including the four border slave states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and the seceded states of Virginia and Tennessee, and the twice seceded state of West Virginia. New York was the home of the most female clerks with 56, followed by Pennsylvania with 28, Maryland with 21, and Massachusetts with 20. The states of California and Oregon contributed to each. The wartime female clerical employees of the Treasury Department ranged in age from 15 to 60 at the time they were appointed. Their average age was 30 and their median age was 28. As might be expected, the married women were on average 10 years older than the single women, but there were single women as old as 50. The tasks outlined in the Register of Female Clerks were predictably narrow. Although the first female clerks had been employed to cut Treasury notes, machinery soon began to perform that task. Nearly half, 47%, of the clerks worked at counting notes, while another 41% worked as copyists. The remaining 12% worked at a variety of jobs, including bond examiner, cutter, trimmer, folder, paper clerk, and the generic designation for duty. Virtually all of the successful applicants received recommendations for someone, from someone, most from their congressman or senator. Of the 351 women listed in the Register of Female Clerks, only two have no names uh, in the column headed Recommended By. Twelve list President Lincoln as a recommender, and others received recommendations from the Secretary of the Treasury, 
or a governor. Eight received a recommendation from the wife of the president, the wife of a cabinet secretary, or the wife of a senator. Without some prominent person to recommend them, it appears that very few, if any, applicants secured a position in the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department was the largest but not the sole government agency to employ women as clerks during the Civil War. The newly formed but tiny Department of Agriculture employed at least one female clerk after its formation in 1862. By 1863, the Patent Office was employing a baker's dozen of female clerks, and another 30 worked at the Quartermaster General's office. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair hired 10 women in 1862 to work as clerks in the Dead Letter Office, and by 1863, half of the 32 clerks in that office were women. The opportunity for women to work in clerical positions in the Treasury and other departments during the Civil War opened up employment opportunities unimaginable a few years earlier. Although some women left these clerical positions with the return of peace, more women were ready to take their places, and the number of women uh, in federal government offices continued to grow through the remainder of the 19th century. Income disparities were severe at first, with female clerks earning between one-third and one-half the salary of male clerks. Initially paid $600 per year, the annual salary for female clerks in the Treasury Department eventually rose to $720 for most by year's end. Uh, by, not by year's end, by war's end, excuse me. By 1870, federal legislation authorized departments to appoint female clerks to the same position as male clerks and pay them accordingly, but enforcement remained uneven. Abraham Lincoln accepted the need for female clerks to fill clerical roles in the offices of an expanding federal government. His personal intervention aided many women in getting an interview and some in securing a job in the Treasury Department. Female applicants appealed to the president from across the North, many feeling that he alone could help them. Their letters shed light on Lincoln's reputation among women in the North, and his endorsements on some of the letters illustrate his willingness to assist dozens of women in dire straits. Occupied with leading a nation, defending it against a domestic rebellion, and experimenting with the status of four million of its most downtrodden inhabitants, President Lincoln still found time to aid individual women who turned to him for help. Thank you. Uh, do you have any information about the hiring of Vinnie Green, the sculptor of the Abraham Lincoln statue? Right. Uh, she was hired in the postal uh, department, I believe. Uh, and most of my records that I'm dealing with here are um, from the Treasury Department. But it is a fascinating aspect. And, and as perhaps some of you know, unfortunately, the um, Personnel records from the Postal Department, which were voluminous for this period, were all destroyed um, in the late 19th or perhaps the early 20th century. Uh, so unfortunately, we do not have the equivalent uh, personnel files, uh, application files, for the Post Office Department that we have for Treasury and Interior and some of the other departments. Uh, but uh, she is a fascinating individual. She uh, got a position as a female clerk at age 15. Um, I think in 1862, and then of course by age 18 was commissioned to, to do a bust of, of Lincoln from life, and then ultimately the statue of Lincoln that is in the Capitol. With all the correspondence uh, that you researched through, mm -hmm. uh, did they establish the system of tracking all the correspondence from the establishment of uh, the country, or did they... Uh, Develop this uh, that's a good question. Um, it, it varies by department. Um, the, the, obviously, the materials that we were looking at for the Treasury Department were personnel files. Um, I don't. I wish one of my colleagues who went through that uh, particular series was here. Uh, I know that in the Interior Department, which was formed in 1849, uh, they kept personnel files from 1849. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say personnel files, application files from 1849 to 1906 in one giant alphabetical arrangement. So we, interested in Lincoln's presidency, had to go through all of those files uh, to look for uh, materials written to Lincoln. Um, the Treasury Department had a similar uh, wide range, date range, um, and uh, uh, but, of course, the Treasury Department had been around much earlier. I can't really speak to earlier records than the mid 
19th century for, for Treasury Department officials. And like this correspondences, they were not kept by the White House. They were sent to the departments right. and whatever department it was addressed to, they kept the files. Exactly. And sometimes the letters um, are that are written to the president, especially, uh, are not specific. You know, I want a job, period. <laughs> uh, and what department they ended up in really depended. Sometimes we'll see letters that moved around from department to department. So it may have gone to one department first. Say in the Treasury Department. Um, our, the scope of our project, though massive, is not unlimited. And so we're only interested in letters uh, to Lincoln for, for the purposes of our project. So many of these letters, or many of these uh, female clerks, would also have had letters written by a congressman uh, or by other people on their behalf. And, and then others would have just had a single letter. It was just fascinating to me because having volunteered uh, at one time with the presidential correspondence, uh, it's just all of a sudden it's dawned on me like, well, how long have they been doing this? <laughs> Uh, was that sort of humble, uh, self-effacing introduction typical even of you know, perhaps male letters to the president of the day? I think it was. Um, perhaps not. I'm sure there's a gender division uh, between female and male letters of application. But certainly I have seen male letters that apologize for intruding upon Lincoln's time, for example, um, because they know he's busy with lots of other things. Um, and uh, so you do have some of that, and, and, and part of it is uh, a general see in the 19th century that, that you don't see today. So one senator may write to another senator in a very sort of self-effacing style and sign it your humble and obedient servant. You know, that, that kind of thing uh, is part of the, the style of correspondence of the time. But I do think there is a, a gender division. I don't speak to that directly here because I... Uh, didn't do a lot of uh, uh, examination of male applicants, but uh, I think there would be some similarities, but also some differences. Well, uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you to all of the morning speakers. And how about that? We were finishing on time. Uh, for those of you who uh, will be unable to return at 1.30 for uh, the afternoon session, uh, I'd just like to point out we have a couple of forms uh, on the tables outside, a questionnaire. We welcome your input on this program to help us plan future programs. Uh, we also have uh, a form if you're not on our mailing list and would like to uh, get on our mailing list and learn about our future programs, we welcome you. To, to sign up for the manual. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you at 1.30. If you uh, don't plan on having lunch and are looking for something to do, there's a wonderful exhibit on Abraham Lincoln at the Library of Congress with uh, some of the documents we've been discussing. If you want to learn more about it, uh, Laura Bellman, one of the docents at the Library of Congress. Laura, Laura raise your hand, and uh, I should be happy to, to tell you more about that. So thank you. We'll see you at 1.30. Okay. of heart always impels you to listen to appeals from the needy and helpless. Helen White of Baltimore had heard of your being a true Christian, and I know if it is in your power to assist me, you will not turn a deaf ear to my petition. Having been assured that our present president reads all the communication addressed to him, Missouri Finley of New York City was hopeful that her epistle may not be passed by without at least a passing thought. Confident of the president's innate goodness, kindness, and honesty, these women appealed to Lincoln directly, desperate to have him intervene on their behalf. Ultimately, the Treasury Department hired at least 351 female clerks between 1861 and Lincoln's assassination in April 1865. 
Of these clerks, 60% were single and 40% were married or widowed. 94 were appointed from the District of Columbia, but many of them had moved to the federal capital to follow husbands, fathers, or other family members who were in government service or the military. The remaining 246 clerks came from 25 states. They came from all of the states of the Union, including the four border slave states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and the seceded states of Virginia and Tennessee, and the twice seceded state of West Virginia. New York was the home of the most female clerks with 56, followed by Pennsylvania with 28, Maryland with 21, and Massachusetts with 20. The states of California and Oregon contributed to each. The wartime female clerical employees of the Treasury Department ranged in age from 15 to 60 at the time they were appointed. Their average age was 30 and their median age was 28. As might be expected, the married women were on average 10 years older than the single women, but there were single women as old as 50. The tasks outlined in the Register of Female Clerks were predictably narrow. Although the first female clerks had been employed to cut Treasury notes, machinery soon began to perform that task. Nearly half, 47%, of the clerks worked at counting notes, while another 41% worked as copyists. The remaining 12% worked at a variety of jobs, including bond examiner, cutter, trimmer, folder, paper clerk, and the generic designation for duty. Virtually all of the successful applicants received recommendations for someone, from someone, most from their congressman or senator. Of the 351 women listed in the Register of Female Clerks, only two have no names uh, in the column headed Recommended By. Twelve list President Lincoln as a recommender, and others received recommendations from the Secretary of the Treasury or a governor. Eight received a recommendation from the wife of the president, the wife of a cabinet secretary, or the wife of a senator. Without some prominent person to recommend them, it appears that very few, if any, applicants secured a position in the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department was the largest but not the sole government agency to employ women as clerks during the Civil War. The newly formed but tiny Department of Agriculture employed at least one female clerk after its formation in 1862. By 1863, the Patent Office was employing a baker's dozen of female clerks, and another 30 worked at the Quartermaster General's office. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair hired 10 women in 1862 to work as clerks in the dead letter office. And by 1863, half of the 32 clerks in that office were women. The opportunity for women to work in clerical positions in the Treasury and other departments during the Civil War opened up employment opportunities unimaginable a few years earlier. Although some women left these clerical positions with the return of peace, more women were ready to take their places, and the number of women uh, in federal government offices continued to grow through the remainder of the 19th century. Income disparities were severe at first, with female clerks earning between one-third and one-half the salary of male clerks. Initially paid $600 per year, the annual salary for female clerks in the Treasury Department eventually rose to $720 for most by year's end. Uh, by, not by years end, by war's end, excuse me. By 1870, federal legislation authorized departments to appoint female clerks to the same position as male clerks and pay them accordingly, but enforcement remained uneven. Abraham Lincoln accepted the need for female clerks to fill clerical roles in the offices of an expanding federal government. His personal intervention aided many women in getting an interview and some in securing a job in the Treasury Department. Female applicants appealed to the president from across the North, many feeling that he alone could help them. Their letters shed light on Lincoln's reputation among women in the North, and his endorsements on some of the letters illustrate his willingness to assist dozens of women in dire straits. Occupied with leading a nation, defending it against a domestic rebellion, and experimenting with the status of four million of its most downtrodden inhabitants, President Lincoln still found time to aid individual women who turned to him for help. Thank you. Uh, do you have any information about my hiring of Vinnie Green, the sculptor of the Abraham Lincoln statue? Right. Uh, she was hired in the postal uh, department, I believe. Uh, and most of my records that I'm dealing with here are um, from the Treasury Department. But it is a fascinating aspect. And, and as perhaps some of you know, unfortunately, the um, 
personnel records from the Postal Department, which were voluminous for this period, were all destroyed um, in the late 19th or perhaps the early 20th century. Uh, so unfortunately, we do not have the equivalent uh, personnel files, uh, application files, for the Post Office Department that we have for Treasury and Interior and some of the other departments. Uh, but uh, she is a fascinating individual. She um, got a position as a female clerk at age 15, um, I think in 1862, and then of course by age 18 was commissioned to, to do a bust of, of Lincoln from life, and then ultimately the statue of Lincoln that is in the Capitol. With all the correspondence uh, that you researched through, mm -hmm. uh, did they establish the system of tracking all the correspondence from the establishment of uh, the country, or did they uh, develop this later? That's a good question. Um, it, it varies by department. Um, the, the, obviously, the materials that we were looking at for the Treasury Department were personnel files. Um, I don't. I wish one of my colleagues who went through that uh, particular series was here. Uh, I know that in the Interior Department, which was formed in 1849, uh, they kept personnel files from 1849. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say personnel files, application files, from 1849 to 1906 in one giant alphabetical arrangement. So we, interested in Lincoln's presidency, had to go through all of those files uh, to look for uh, materials written to Lincoln. Um, the Treasury Department had a similar uh, wide range, date range, um, and uh, uh, but of course the Treasury Department had been around much earlier. I can't really speak to earlier records than the mid 19th century for, for Treasury Department officials. And like this correspondence, they were not kept by the White House. They were sent to the departments right. or whatever department it was addressed to. They kept the files. Exactly. And sometimes the letters um, are that are written to the president, especially, uh, are not specific. To, to, you know, I want a job. Period. <laughs> uh, and what department they ended up in really depended. Sometimes we'll see letters that moved around from department to department. So it may have gone to one department first. Say in the Treasury Department. Um, our, the scope of our project, though massive, is not unlimited. And so we're only interested in letters um, to Lincoln for, for the purposes of our project. So many of these letters, or many of these uh, female clerks, would also have had letters written by congressmen uh, or by other people on their behalf. And, and then others would have just had a single letter. It was just fascinating to me because having volunteered uh, at one time with the presidential correspondence, uh, it's just all of a sudden it's dawned on me like, well, how long have they been doing this? <laughs> Uh, was that sort of humble, uh, self-effacing introduction typical, even of you know, perhaps male letters to the president of the day? I think it was. Um, perhaps not. I'm sure there's a gender division uh, between uh, female and male letters of application. But certainly I have seen male letters that apologize for intruding upon Lincoln's time, for example, um, because they know he's busy with lots of other things. Um, and uh, so you do have some of that. And, and, and part of it is uh, a general see in the 19th century that, that you don't see today. So one senator may write to another senator in a very sort of self-effacing style and sign it your humble and obedient servant. You know, that, that kind of thing uh, is part of the, the style of correspondence of the time. But I do think there is a, a gender division. I don't speak to that directly here because I... Uh, didn't do a lot of uh, uh, examination of male applicants, but uh, I think there would be some similarities, but also some differences.